Okay, welcome back. Um, uh, we spent the first hour started in looking at uh, understanding roles for the husband and the wife. We've been looking at scripture. Uh, we looked at a couple of passages, drew out uh, the main roles that's been designed by God. We've seen the parallel of how Christ is with the church. Uh, and we took that parallel and spoke of different roles. So uh, the next part uh, and um, uh, a few um, details on what are some of the responsibilities for those who are in ministry, though, uh, and especially when it comes to the home and when it comes to the family. Uh, so as I as I did mention that um, the responsibilities for those who belong in ministry or you know, we are involved in a local church community. There are certain standards and conduct that we need to follow. And uh, that, uh, so, so this will apply to any believer, right? Any of us here as believers, it applies to any one of us. Um, so one of the things I think, uh, this, this is specifically not put in the book, but I really want to address this here is uh, a lot of times, and I've seen this as a, uh, you know, when, when I've done marriage seminars among uh, ministers of God, be it pastors or uh, lay leaders, lay ministers, um, I kind of ask people to put up, a, a, you know, like like a hierarchy of what your how 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 do you build your relationship, or how do you put in a certain hierarchy your relationship with God, your relationship with your family and your ministry or your work, right? And, uh, it's a, and it's quite interesting to see what people think. Um, so I think everyone by default know that God is placed first uh, in everyone's lives. But often I do see that there is a confusion uh, for people, especially for ministers, um, that whether uh, you, know, you consider your family uh, greater or higher or you spend invest time and energy in building the family um, for first that's right after god after, uh, first or whether it's your ministry okay and a lot of people get that a bit mixed up um, and they and they sense that okay god is the priority like i said that's default they know that but when it comes to the second place they usually put ministry up up front and then comes the needs of the family or the needs of a, of a spouse right but in god's um, government, uh, the family is the first place where you are ministering. Okay, that's your initial ministry. Your family, that's your spouse, your children, your home is the initial ministry. And from that, as an outflow of that, comes your ministry to a larger community, be it the church or or whatever um, ministry you may be doing. So keep that in mind that. Uh, God remains first, and then your greatest responsibility is towards your own family. That's the mini church, right? That's the first uh, establishment of a church that comes, and from and church is a group of people coming together uh, to worship and praise the Lord. It's not just a building, right? And then comes ministry. So, just to ensure that you keep that uh, in mind, and you will see, and, and Scripture really brings about. Uh, a, a lot of that draws on some of those principles. Okay, so let's just look at uh, some um, verses, and we will carry. And and I think what we'll do is, as we read those uh, the scripture, we will come uh, to find or to bring about what are some of the responsibilities as a believer, as a minister that you have towards your home and your family. Okay, so. Um, We'll just take time to read all that, all the scripture, and then we just pick up some important roles and responsibilities for the husband and the wife. Okay, so could someone read First Timothy chapter three, verses one to thirteen? And there are um, four other references, and we can go that. So, if someone has the book open, if you all have the book with you, uh, I think those of you who are in class. Uh, one one after the other, you could just read that. So that's First Timothy chapter three verses one to thirty. That's the first one. Then First Timothy chapter five verse eight, 
Titus 1, 6 to 9 and Titus 2, 1 to 6. If you all could just read that and then we'll pick up uh, verses and uh, uh, understand that better. Yes. This is a true saying. If a man is eager to be a church leader, he desires an excellent work. <clears throat> A church leader must be without fault. He must have only one wife, be sober, self-controlled, and orderly. He must welcome strangers in his home. He must be able to teach. He must not be a drunkard or, or a violent man, but gentle and peaceful. He must not love money. He must be able to manage his own family well and make his children obey him with all respect. For if a man does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of the church of God? He must be mature in the faith so that he will not swell up with pride and be condemned as the devil was. He should be a man who is respected by the people outside the church so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. Church helpers must also have a good character and be sincere. They must not drink too much wine or be greedy for money. They should hold to the revealed truth of the faith with a clear conscience. They should be tested first and then if they pass the test they are to serve their wives also must be of good character and must not gossip they must be sober and honest in everything a church helper must have only one wife and be able to manage his children and family well those helpers who do their work well win for themselves a good standing and are able to speak boldly about their faith in christ jesus thank you Randy. Someone else could read the other two, 1 Timothy 5.8 and Titus 1.6-9. 1 Timothy 5.8. But if any do, any do not take care of their relatives, especially the members of their own family, they have denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever. Was that uh, Radha? It's good news. Uh, Titus 1 verses 6 to 9. An elder must be blameless. He must have only one wife and his children must be uh, believers. Go ahead. Right. An elder must be without fault. He must have only one wife and his children must be believers and not have the reputation of being wild or disobedient. For since the church, uh, a church leader is in charge of God's work, he should be without fault. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for money. He must be hospitable and love what is good. He must be self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the message which can be trusted and which agrees with the doctrine. In this way, he will be able to encourage others with the true teaching and also to show the error of those who are opposed to it. Thank you. One more. Titus 2, 1 to 6. Titus 2, 1 to 6. But you must teach what agrees with the sound doctrine. Instruct the older men to be sober, sensible, and self controlled, to be sound in their faith, love, and endurance. In the same way, instruct the older women to behave as women should who live a holy life. They must not be slanders or slaves to wine. They must teach what is good. In order to train the younger women to love their husbands and children to be self-controlled and pure and to be good housewife who submit themselves to their husband so that no one to be self-controlled and so no one will speak evil of the message that comes from god in the same way are urged uh, the young man to be self-controlled okay thank you thank you students for doing that Okay, so looking just looking at this entire, um, all of these verses, we will just put up some points and it's given in a tabular form in your book. And I just read that out. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't require any kind of an explanation. It's quite self-explanatory. But just to bring back the focus, to really put out the focus. So the role of a believing husband uh, should be, they should have only one wife, should be sober, self-controlled and orderly. They must they need to be hospitable they not uh, they should not be a drunkard or a violent man but gentle and peaceful does not love money um, is able to manage his own family well 
ensure that his children obey him with respect, take care of other members of his family, do not, not to be arrogant or quick-tempered, or uh, but be self-controlled, and his children must be believers and not have the reputation of being wild or disobedient. If you look at um, uh, the wife, the wife needs to be of good character, not gossip, be sober and honest in everything, love her own husband and children, be self-controlled and pure, be a good housewife, taking care of the home, and to submit to one's own husband. So in all of this, you see the importance that, um, that uh, uh, you know, Paul brings out to, to each, of, in each of his letters to them, that the way that he expected, or he said, you know, this is what God expects of you as a minister to be, to be able to live, to lead your personal life in such a way that you are a testimony for, the Lord. So to ensure that these responsibilities um, are taken care of before you are out there teaching and preaching. So I think that's important for us. And it's a good check for each one of us to ensure that we are in step with these roles and responsibilities um, that we have in our families, even as each of us are believers and ministers. Okay. Um, one of another one of uh, another part of marriage is the way that uh, uh, sexual intimacy uh, happens or goes on, right? And what is the role of the husband and wife when it comes to sexual intimacy? And we'll read through First uh, Corinthians seven one to six, and again just pick out some key points. But we will be looking at uh, sex and sexuality in greater detail in a chapter to come. But this is when we're looking at roles and responsibilities. What is the role of the husband and wife in marriage? Okay, so I'm I'm just going to pick up these verses. So I'll read out the verse and then we will uh, bring out the key points. So I'm at First Corinthians chapter seven, verse two, and I'll read that out. It says, "It's good for a man to have a wife and for a woman to have a husband. Sexual drives are strong." But marriage is strong enough to contain them and provide for a balanced and fulfilling sexual life in a world of sexual disorder. So uh, the the role of sex in marriage is to ensure that both that, that there is a balanced and a fulfilling sexual experience, sexual intimacy between the husband and wife, and that's what the role of a husband and wife is. Verse three it says the marriage bed must be a place of mutuality the husband seeking to satisfy his wife, the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. Now, this talks of how the role is uh, of, of uh, husband and wife is to be is to mutually experience um, enjoyment and satisfaction while being uh, while enjoying sexual intimacy. So it's a place of mutuality that both the husband and the wife are in a place of agreement to satisfy one another. Okay. And um, verse four, um, marriage is not a place to stand up for your rights. It's a decision to serve one another, uh, serve the other, whether in bed or out. So here it is an opportunity for them. It's an enjoyment and it's something that you do not holding back or not using it as a weapon against one another, especially when there are conflicts. Okay, then verse five, it says abstaining from sex is permissible for, for a, a period of time if you both agree to it, and if it's for the purposes of prayer and fasting, but only for such time. So it says abstaining from sex comes when during shorter periods of time, especially when it is to do with prayer and fasting. And the last one uh, is, um, yeah, that Satan has, um, uh, verse 5 again, Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect it. So this area of sexuality often becomes a place of attack and uh, uh, for the enemy. So to ensure that it is a fulfilling uh, a time is is important, and that's the role of a husband and wife in when it, when it comes to sexual intimacy in marriage. Okay, uh, when you look at Proverbs thirty one, you will you would. Uh, you will notice, uh, you know, often I think Proverbs 31 is generally quoted um, uh, to the husband saying, 
you know, uh, and, and if you ask a lot of people, they say, you know, I want a Proverbs 31 woman. But um, what you what you also need to notice here is a Proverbs 31 uh, woman uh, also has a Proverbs 31 husband. OK, and so let's uh, let's just probably look at some of those, um, you know, so that that entire passage and see what it really talks about how uh, how you can or or you you can be a proverbs 31 husband so that you bring about a proverbs 31 you know, woman okay so there are a lot of uh, uh, things that are stated in here that actually helps us see that so we will read um, again i just bring about the verses so verse 11 says her husband puts his confidence in her and he will never be poor. So this is a place where you see that the husband is actually trusting uh, his wife, okay, trusting his wife in such a way so that there are so many things that she can do. And that's, um, you know, verse 12, verse 13 onwards. She keeps herself busy making wool and linen cloth. Uh, verse 14, she brings home food from out of the way places as merchant ships do. Verse 15, she gets up before daylight to prepare food for her family and to tell her servant women what to do. Verse 16, she looks at land and buys it, and with money she has earned, she plants a vineyard. 17, she is a hard worker, strong and industrious. Verse 18, she knows the value of everything she makes and works late into the night. Verse 19, she spins her own thread and weaves her own cloth. Verse 20, she's generous to the poor and needy. Verse 21, she doesn't worry when it snows because her family has warm clothing. Uh, verse uh, 22, she makes bedspreads and wears clothes of the fine purple linen. Verse 23, her husband is well known, leading citizens. She makes clothes and belts and sells them to the merchants. Verse 25, she's strong uh, and respected and not afraid of the future. So. Uh, so through this, what do you see? Yes, you see from verse 13 to I think verse 25, 26, again, uh, 27, she's always busy and looks after her family needs, the way that the woman works. But in the midst of this, you know, uh, bought and tucked in quite neatly is verse 11 and verse um, 23. Verse 11 says her husband puts his confidence in her, which means... Um, he's given her the liberty and the freedom, has, knows her, cherishes her, nourishes her in such a way that she's able to do all of this, okay? Has her support, has, has, uh, she has his support in order to do this. And verse 23, her husband is well known, one of the leading citizens. And what does this mean? That means he's also doing his job. He's, he's where he should be. He's probably... Uh, earning for the family, he's he's taken the responsibility of taking care of of things that's uh, known to him. All right. Um, uh, what else does it say? The children, verse twenty eight. Her children show her appreciation, and her husband praises her. So here you see the husband also applauding her, acknowledging what she does. So as her husband praises her, the children also show appreciation. So shows that the husband treats her well, is able to uh, really build her up in such a way that even the children show their appreciation to her. Verse 29, he says, many women are good wives, but you are the best of them all. So it, it shows that, um, uh, you know, he, he's, he's actually probably you can, you can picture him you know, praising her in at his workplace or wherever he is, you know, but he's one of the leading citizens. Maybe he's sitting in a in a courtroom and he's talking about the good things that his wife does. So he's praising her. He's he is uh, really in awe of how and what she what she is. That's how he says many women are good wives, but you are the best of them all. And he's also probably telling her, you know, that you know, there's none like you, my lovely wife, right? Uh, verse 31, it says, give her credit for all she does. She deserves the respect of everyone. So that's that's what the husband probably is also doing, giving her credit and ensuring that she has 
the respect uh, of her uh, of her husband so this this um, entire proverbs 31 is just not for the 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 virtuous woman but also for the husband who helps his wife to be as virtuous okay wonderful okay now um uh, uh, before i just move on is there any question up until now any questions that you may have yes Mina, go ahead uh can i unmute and speak is that okay yes yes go ahead yeah. go ahead yeah so uh the list of all those virtues in proverbs 31 as far as the woman is concerned i mean mm -hmm. the expectations are high and there are a lot of things that okay she is doing right mm -hmm. so what happens is while uh, uh, on one hand the overall picture can be kept in mind and uh, uh, one works towards this so but what happens if you know like that kind of a thing is uh, i mean in today's day and age i'm just speaking generally mm -hmm. uh, it's not possible to be all this and more and there is industry, I mean, she's industrious and she does a whole lot of things, right? So, what happens if all of that doesn't happen? I mean, it's not, I mean, may not be happening on a regular basis, or it is, you know, uh, uh, maybe it's asking for uh, too much, then what happens? Right? Mm, okay, okay, that's a that's a great question. So, uh, so Nina, I mean, uh, the way that I see this is this was in a setting, or this was written in a setting, and if you look at all of this that's um, that that's been written, there's a lot of work that she's doing that comes from um, you know a lot of things that she's doing from scratch, right? And if you see, probably this this woman is one who who's who has been noted to be somebody like a, like like a, a leader okay but it, it also think of the setting the setting is um maybe maybe an uh, older jewish home where there are uh, you know a wealthier home where there are different things there are different uh, people to support and help so it's coming from a setting like that i think what we need to look at is looking for principles and if you look at principles, it talks about how the woman is able to manage different responsibilities that's given to her, rather than, you know, should I be spinning my own clothes? Should I be, you know, making my own food right from scratch? Should I be ensuring that, um, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing philanthropic work? So look at principles around. Whatever God's put into, your hands whatever god's put into your sphere of influence is what we are called to do so maybe for us let's say a woman here on on this uh, uh, in this uh, in in our time and space okay maybe it's a work outside okay so you, you need to get engaged in that um it, it may not be practical of doing the work at home also so it's fine to have let's say uh, an added help in it but it is maybe uh, some way of overseeing things. Maybe it's not practical to teach the children ABCD. So it's ensuring that they get their support in that way. So taking principles from it is being able to take on the responsibilities that a woman has, rather than it being, it being every single thing that is spoken about over here. That uh, the woman who is able to balance what is given to her so and i'd say if if that is uh, and because we're all different and we are people who are um who have different kinds of personalities and what god's put into into our hearts um there are there may be some women who would like to ensure that their responsibility is only at the home and that's perfectly okay even if they don't work out certain that of course has to be done in uh, communication with their with their spouse. Nevertheless, if they are willing to take up the responsibility of the home and doing it well and doing it according to uh, pleasing the Lord, that's what matters more than the number of tick marks that you can have of you know making their own clothes and cooking food and getting up early and providing for the maids and all of that. But 
it basically, the principle that you can take on is whatever God's put in you to be able to balance it and do it in the best capacity that you can. And of course, the character, there's a lot that talks about character, right? Verse 25, it says she's strong and respected. She um, speaks with a gentle, with gentle wisdom. Uh, the husband says, you know, uh, uh, you, you're the best of them all. It, it also talks about she's one who honors the Lord. So it, it specifically talks about being ensuring that you know, even your character is, is in one in step with what God wants. So look at it as a principle rather at maybe smaller, finer details. Did that help, uh, Nina? OK, I suppose so, Nina, don't get to hear from you, but I suppose so. OK, so OK, all right. Yeah, sure, sure. go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I can. I can, Nina, go ahead. The, the husband appreciates all of that, right? It is a thing. So what happens if the woman is OK doing whatever mm, she can? Nina, I've lost Not you. forthcoming. Nina lost you. Can you repeat that question oh, once again? Great. Can you write Said, down your question, the, Nina? Now can you hear me? Yeah, I can, but you're, you're breaking up in between. Nina, I've lost uh, lost you once again. Um, if you can write down your question, that will help. OK, I think Rose has also mentioned, she said, I'd really like this part where it says at the end of page 46 to be a Proverbs 31 wife. Uh, I need to be a Proverbs 31 husband. The Proverbs 31 is not just for women, but for men too. Yes, it is. OK. All right, so Nina, while we wait for your question, we'll just um, look through uh, the last part of this. And this comes in your application, and it's on page 50, if I write in the notes, uh, or page 47. OK, it's on page 47. And uh, I just want to explain some of this uh, because I think it's 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 a practical insight into how we express love uh, for one another. Okay. Now, the this book was written by a person by name Dr. Gary Chapman, and this book is called The Five Love Languages, and he describes how we express love and how we feel love. Okay. And uh, he spoke about these. Um, five languages uh, of the way people generally, it's a research that he did to find out how people express love and how one feels love. So when you look at these five love languages, and uh, it's there in the chart, but I'll just speak of it. The first one is physical touch. Physical touch is what speaks, um, uh, that, that they express or they feel love when it is, um, uh, with this, it is with the touch. Now, this is not just sexual touch, but it can also be non-sexual. But uh, love speaks very strongly when there is uh, touch, when there is physical touch. Then comes words of affirmation that a person feels love when there are words that are spoken to them. Okay, spoken uh, loving words, uh, words that are build, that build, that edify, that encourage. All of that are. When, when they speak words, that's what they experience. The third one is acts of service. Acts of service is when you're doing something for the other person, okay? That is actually doing some service, right? It could be, it could be in any form, maybe paying a bill or doing a chore or, you know, washing clothes or doing the dishes or ensuring that the car is cleaned or some kind of service or bringing a cup of coffee or cooking a nice meal. All of that's called the acts of service. Then comes quality time. Quality time is ensuring that you give the person attention, spending time with them, either um, every day talking about different things or going out for walks together, playing games together, doing a certain hobby together, going for dates together. That's what is quality time. And the last one is uh, receiving gifts. Receiving gifts is, you know, giving something that's thoughtful 
to the other and also receiving. So when you look at this five love languages, often uh, um, uh, the importance of each of this can vary for each person. Okay, So it may not, it, it doesn't mean that it has to be in a certain order, but uh, it may one or two may be of higher priority and higher importance to to a person to one of the spouses and the other two may be of higher importance to the other spouse now what happens is that we often show love or express love in the way that we feel love so if i feel love by acts of service i generally tend to even show love through acts of service or if I feel love when I someone spends time with me, I also may express it by spending time with somebody else. Okay, so that becomes a very dominant um, um, characteristic about the way that we express or that we uh, that we feel love and that we express love. And so also the other person, the way that they feel love is the way that they express love. Now a lot of times. Conflicts often occur or people feel or uh, couples feel that they are not loved because they have not been, they haven't felt loved because their primary love language has not been spoken or has not been, um, uh, uh, is not what is taking place, right? So let's say the husband has um, maybe his primary love language is physical touch. Whereas the wife's primary language may be acts of service. So the wife continues to do everything, you know, irons his clothes, um, you know, keeps his shoes ready, ensures he has a tiffin to carry, brings him a coffee, massages his feet, all of that. But still, the husband doesn't experience the love because that's not his primary love language, and vice versa. So it is a good thing to understand this um, the way that you personally feel and express love and the way your spouse feels and expresses love and once and and if you look at uh, that entire um verse uh, sorry pages 48 page 49 uh and yeah page 48 and 49 when you look at that there is a certain you know a, a quick questionnaire that you can generally do to understand where what represents your love language it's good to know yours it's good to know your spouses and doing the best to ensure that you speak the language of your spouse rather than um when when you're allowed to get to speak the language of your spouse rather than expressing it from what seems dominant to you so it's something that you can take time to do um, it's it's a good thing to understand and uh, also come to see how you can personally express um, what, depending on what the language is for your spouse how can you express that love language to the to your spouse now that's something that can happen through proper communication being able to really discuss about about all of this it's it's something that you can do okay so that's a that's a homework that uh, you can you can do. All right. Uh, I think Nina, you've written your question. So she's written: If the appreciation and support from the husband is not forthcoming, then does the wife continue to do what she's doing? It could be a strain. Okay. So um, yeah. So some of this can you know. Uh, when when the bible talks about certain principles it definitely talks you know a lot of things are enhanced when you do see like especially in this proverbs 31 we do see that there is something that the husband does that really builds into something the wife does and something that the wife does builds into something what that the husband does so the husband being um praising her supporting her nourishing her encouraging her gives her the impetus to you know multitask all of this and the as she's doing that it it gives the 
the charge for the husband to say more or to encourage her more and more. So everything is, you see everything is a vicious cycle, okay? But yes, as we walk through life, we do definitely see that sometimes this doesn't happen. Nevertheless, um, our submission or whatever we do, you know, as Paul talks about it, whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. So, and I think that's that's a wonderful um, uh, a word that we need to stand on because um, when we are able to do things for the Lord, uh, we find that our expectation about what we need from our spouse may not be as high. Well, well, ideally, or in the way that God ordained it, it's definitely needed that the husband does it. And, and when you look at these roles in itself, if a husband and a wife are to play these roles as assigned by God, being obedient to what God wants, you'd see that the union is, is meant to be beautiful. It's designed to be holy. But like many things that you see, when we don't stand in uh, in accordance to what God desires, there are consequences to it. And you know, there are some chapters later that may deal with some part of this question. Is that um, you may not like, for example, the wife may be doing a lot of this, but may not be receiving the appreciation, the love, the um, the acknowledgement from the husband. And it becomes a strain. And, and for no fault of hers, she bears also a consequence, right? It is true. It's true that happens. And that's, that's when we learn and we understand the focus and our um, desire to please God comes above anything else. And when we do that, when we desire to please God, He's the one who empowers us to do whatever we need to do. In the natural, yes, it is a strain. In the natural, it is a burden, right? It may, it may feel very un demotivating for the wife to continue doing things. Maybe when the husband hasn't taken on his responsibility or his role, right? It becomes a huge strain. It becomes a huge burden. And that's when we move to... Uh, not that's when, uh, but we move to seeking it from the Lord, to going and um, going back to the Lord for the help we need to ensure that we are doing what God wants us to do. So yes, naturally it is a strain. And that's why when we pin our hopes, even, even when, you know, when we talk about in marriage, building our love for one another, uh, there can be times when there are a lot of instances in our lives that takes place that 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 oneness doesn't come because of some sin or some uh, issue in uh, because of one person or what one person has done. Our focus is to the Lord. Our focus is saying, Lord, this is something that I need to do because because I honor you because of what your word says about me. So the focus is on the Lord in all things, in all things, whether it be marriage, whether it be studies, whether it be work, in all things, um, our desire is to please the Lord. And by pleasing the Lord, we're bringing uh, uh, our spouses closer to us. So yes, that's a difficult question. But nevertheless, in, uh, with regard to everything, our desire is to please the Lord and take from his strength whatever we can do. All right, I think Rose has another question. What about widows or widowers who have remarried and they are unable to show the same love that they once had for their first love? Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, again, this is a topic we will slightly talk about later, but nevertheless, um, if there is a widow or a widower planning to be married, um, one of the important things that um, um, a, a couple needs to do is to ensure that they go through a marriage preparation course. Okay, all because you have done it 
maybe at your initial time of your wedding, the first wedding, okay, or your first marriage, um, and have spent a couple of years with with your spouse, uh, uh, and then you know that there has been a death. Uh, in this case, it's a death, right? And you're remarrying. There, there needs to be a revisiting, a, a repreparation of um, of those seven points that we spoke about. Okay, because um, there can be very many things that one carries into marriage, right? Even though uh, one has lost their spouse, and that's something that definitely requires to be done. So. I don't see much of a difference that even if you're freshly married or you're marrying remarrying because of a death of a spouse, you still need to undergo a preparation because the person you're marrying is a very different person from maybe the person you married earlier. And their likes, their dislikes, who they are, what they are, their kind of traits are very difficult. So going through a preparation is very important to do so. Because while you're going through the preparation, you're you're getting insights about yourself about is this a, a renewed attachment that you can make you know after the after the first marriage so i'd say if it is for a widow or a widower who is considering remarriage again going through a premarital session is highly important because you need to um uh you know heal from whatever however uh, whatever has happened in the first marriage or whatever issues that's there, then heal from that before you enter into the second one. Okay, I hope I answered that, Rose. Okay, um, Sean, you've asked, ma'am, is this a good order for a person to have in his or her life? God, family, ministry, work, friends, and other things. Yep, it is. That sounds like a good one. Uh, that sounds like a good structure. Uh, Rose, did I answer your question? And even uh, Nina, I hope I answered your questions. Oh, Rose. Oh, that's Rin. Oh, sorry, Rin. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Um, any more questions? Okay. If there isn't a question, I think we can close today's um, today's class, and uh, yeah, we could uh, reconnect next week. Can I request any one of you to pray? Nikhil, Nikhil Masi, would you like to close with a word of prayer? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Go ahead. Father, we thank you for this day, for this time, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful moment, Lord, you gave us, Father. As I pray what we have learned, Father, we can apply, Lord Jesus, in our life, Father. Thank you for them, Lord. Thank you what you have taught us, Father. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, students. God bless you. Have a blessed week. I will meet you next week, week five. Thank you. God bless.